Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm speaking with Michael Fontaine, professor and associate vice provost of undergraduate education at the Department of Classics at Cornell University in New York. He's the author of many books, including The Pig Wars and How to Drink, a classical guide to the art of imbibing. Today we discuss a difficult subject, suicide and the history of mental illness in the ancient world, the different contrasting beliefs between Hippocrates and Epicurus, and the modern implications of these theories. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a Society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. Now you have written quite extensively about mental illness uh, with regards to the ancient world. Maybe we could start off with you giving a little bit of a refresher explanation to our listeners of exactly what mental illness looked like in the ancient world. Well, that is really what the question is all about. Um, In the ancient world, they didn't really have mental illness in the forms of it that we talk about these things today. And so the question is, why would that happen? Uh, So human behaviors are likely to be the same then as they are today, but they didn't have any of the words that we're currently using for mental illness. And that's precisely what got me interested in the topic some years ago, uh, was we we throw around these words like depression or schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, that sort of thing. But in the ancient world, they don't have any of those words. And you wonder, how do they conceive of these same behaviors, these same emotions or feelings or attitudes or however you want to characterize them? And uh, so it really depends on where you look in the ancient literature to see what they're going to have to say about mental illness back then. There was a book that came out uh, three or four years ago. And the editors and the authors of that book went back and they looked at all the ancient medical writers. And sure enough, the ancient medical writers like Hippocrates or Galen, Celsus, some of these other figures, they have ideas about what we would call mental illness. Uh, But if you go to the ancient philosophers, they have far more to say about it. Uh, And then again, if you go to, say, the Greek tragedians, they have all the same behaviors and attitudes and so on on display, and they have yet another way of characterizing all these things. And um, I guess you have the terminology for um, mental illness, but surely we can see examples of what we would now deem mental illness, particularly in, say, Greek tragedy. Uh, You think of a character like Medea or Clytemestra. Uh, These would be people we would definitely describe as having mental illness with today's terminology. Well, so that's really what I'm interested in, right? Is uh, Medea is the perfect example there, isn't she? With Medea, uh, she's the classic case of the mother that you see today in the news periodically who murder, murders her own children for various reasons. Now, if you read Euripides' play, the question is why does she do it? And she's not doing it as Euripides creates her because of some chemical imbalance. Uh, She's not doing it because of some lesion in the brain or some broken brain, which is how some people tend to think of it today. She has reasons rather than um, causes for her behavior. It's just for the listeners, right? I mean, typically we ought to be describing uh, goal-directed behavior as having reasons. You know, I I drink a cup of coffee for a reason. I don't drink it because I'm caused to do it the way I would be caused to have a seizure if I have epilepsy or I would be caused to fall down if you pushed me. Uh, But when you get to the category of mental illness in the modern world, uh, within the realm of psychiatry, uh, this is typically the very uh, explanation for why people do heinous things or why they're unhappy. They say, well, my body is causing me to feel this way, or I'm hearing voices that are causing me to commit murder, and so on. Uh, And so I find that very interesting that within the world that, say, Euripides creates of the Medea, it's perfectly understandable why she does these things. You know, she's a 
uh, an immigrant brought to a new community and promptly discarded, abandoned by her husband, left with no resources. Meanwhile, the husband takes up with a, another woman. And uh, she's completely desperate. She, these, these are the things she says in her long speech. I'm, I'm desperate. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You bring me here. You abandon me. I have these kids. And so to exact revenge, this is not to endorse what she does, but it's certainly understandable, I think, or uh, many readers think so. Now, of course, uh, we might also say this is indicative of Euripides' mind because in the original mythology of Medea, she doesn't kill her children, and uh, Euripides has, has made her a little bit more uh, tr tr tragic than, than the, the mythology that you see in Corinth. Absolutely. I think that's a, uh, an excellent point. So why was Euripides interested in recreating Medea from this old tradition into the character that's so memorable that we know where she murders her children. And I would guess, I don't think we have any real evidence for this, but I would guess it's because he saw within his own society uh, women who, who committed these acts of murdering their kids. You know, why does he create Hercules, or Heracles, I should say, in the Heracles, in that tragedy? Heracles uh, is a combat veteran. He returns home and he shoots his family. Uh, again, these are things that we see about with returning combat veterans. Nowadays, uh, people would say, well, they have PTSD. They used to say they had battle fatigue, something like that. Uh, but what's interesting is the reactions we have today. When someone does those things, if we don't put them in prison, we tend to commit them to a mental hospital and give them drugs that are called medicine. And when you call the drugs medicine, people assume they're medicating a problem within the body rather than, you might say, a problem in that person's life. And this sort of um, relates to some other things I've, I've read uh, that you've written and have spoken about, about the kind of parallel understanding of inter uh, the, the mental illness in the ancient world stemming from Hippocrates' uh, beliefs in the medical world versus Epicurus' philosophies. Yes, that's the distinction I find so fascinating. It's one of the things we're arguing about today, right? So if someone goes to a therapist, the therapist with a problem, say I'm unhappy at home and the, and, and the therapist concludes, well, you have depression, then they will recommend two courses of treatment uh, typically, right? One would either be uh, drugs, you know, medicines uh, to inhibit serotonin or something like that, or they would recommend talk therapy or sometimes both. And that's exactly what's happening in the ancient world. If you go to Hippocrates or you go to some of these other doctors in the ancient world, they have uh, a drug back then called hellebore that they would give you to try and knock out your unhappiness. Uh, or you could go to the philosophers who would say, you know, what's wrong with your life? If you went to Epicurus, he would say, well, it's because you're afraid of death. Whether you're thinking about it consciously or it's always on your mind or it's just yeah, as you get older, you're always worried about the process of dying and being dead and leaving behind everything you love, and that's what's driving your anxiety. And so, of course, Epicurus decides to come up with a whole philosophy on how to change your mind and say, well, there's no hell to be afraid of when you die, so you need to get that thought out of your mind. And once that anxiety dissipates, you will learn to reevaluate what you have here in this world, and that will start making the problems in your life go away. Sometimes easier said than done, granted. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly not easy, is it? <laughs> and it's also not clear that telling people there's no life after death will make them happy. Uh, Epicurus was sure that was true, and Lucretius was sure that was true, and many, many Epicureans were sure that was true. But as, uh, as you can tell by looking around the world today, there are many more people, uh, certainly here in the United States, that believe in life after death than there are Epicureans or... or uh, atheists, for that matter. Well, and some of the problems you have with Epicurus and Lucretius as well is that it doesn't necessarily address um, the fear we might have of leaving people behind, because even if they say, well, don't worry, we won't, you won't worry about them once you're dead, uh, you can worry about it before you're dead, <laughs> uh, and that can <laughs> cause stress and anxiety in your life. I, I agree with you. I think that's one of the points, certainly in Lucretius. Uh, everybody gets to this passage. I think it's in book, uh, the end of book three, maybe at the beginning of book four, where he, he sort of ridicules the lament of, oh, when you're gone, you're, you, know, you won't hear your children any longer, and so on. You won't hear the, the tears for you. And he says, don't be a fool. You won't be around. That's impossible. Uh, but everybody says, but well, hang on. I'm thinking about that stuff right now. Uh, 
And so I agree, that is one of the toughest parts of the entire thing. It's interesting, that's why Lucretius, I think, structures the uh, De Rerum Natura in the fashion that he does. He starts with physics, you know, atoms moving around in the void, and tries to build up to what is probably the weakest point in saying you need to stop worrying about dying, rather than leading with you need to with that point about, well, there's no life after death. Uh, so if you can go along with him that far into the philosophy, sometimes people are convinced. Usually they're not so convinced. Um, but it is interesting that he, he says that is the source of anxiety, and that is why people are unhappy. It's not because of imbalances. A point that I've made in a few things that I've, I've written, and I've spoken to psychiatrists about this who are sort of interested, is that in the ancient world, as you know, uh, the, the predominant theory wasn't cellular lesions that were causing diseases. It was imbalance of the humors, right? This, I'm sure you're familiar with this, right? So the black bile and the, the white bile and the yellow bile, and they all get out of whack. But this is, so that idea was completely discarded in the 19th century uh, for the disease model, which is now completely predicated not, except in the realm of mental illness, but in every other domain of medicine is predicated on lesions of the body, uh, typically of the cells. And yet it snuck back in the door with the idea of chemical imbalances for mental illness. Yeah, we, we just, we, we can't seem to shake the, the humors. I, I actually just saw, I think it was like a New York Times article recently saying about how the understanding the four humors could uh, help you figure out how to work better in the workplace. And, and I was like, oh no, it's, it's coming back again still. Uh, it's getting trendy. Well, I, one thing that I think, is, I mean, I, uh, certainly the, the medical record speaks for itself that the, uh, our current model is better than what they had back then. But one risk we do have, um, and I think we run a lot these days, is reducing things too much. Right, so this is how Epicurus goes to try and attack your fear of death. He takes you literally down to the atomic level to explain the way the universe works. And sometimes when you go that far down, you reduce things. You miss all the forest for the trees that make it up. And uh, so it would be interesting. Right? I mean, right now, nutrition uh, and all these fad diets and things are, are based on sort of um, microscopic examinations of the components of food rather than the, than the holistic idea of you know eating the carrot as opposed to chopping it up and, and straining out everything except the one vitamin that we think is helpful for us. Yeah, we, uh, I think taking a step back can be very helpful at times personally. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, I was thinking uh, another extreme of mental illness that today we think of immediately as, as sort of the end point of extreme mental illness, but had very different understanding and implications in the ancient world is the concept of suicide. Uh, that today we just sort of assume that that's obviously a negative thing at the very end of, of pain and, and suffering. But obviously in the ancient Greek and even more so in the ancient Roman world, uh, suicide wasn't seen that way. Well, so yeah, th of course, this is a really difficult topic and I wanna try and be as you know sensitive as I can about it. Uh, but suicide is tough. It, within the realm of psychiatry, it is typically characterized as the end point of mental illness. Uh, but again, that gets to the idea that you somehow suicide is caused rather than has reasons for it. I mean, people leave suicide notes and they explain their thinking. Um, a friend of mine, when he was 92 years old, uh, he had written several books on the right to death, as he called it, or the right to a dignified suicide. And uh, so when he was 92 years old, he fell at home and broke his back. And the doctor said, well, we're going to operate immediately. And he said, don't be absurd. And he went home and he took his life with a bottle of barbiturates. And, you know, people were aghast and they said, oh, he was crazy. But other people said, well, here was a man who said, he always said his whole life he wanted to choose his time of death. Uh, and that his highest value was not life itself, but quality of life. And so it gets a bit tricky if you take suicide, if you regard it as a sort of a species of mental illness, it gets very tricky when you get to someone that, you know, they describe why they're making this terrible choice for themselves, uh, and it makes sense to us. I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, I, I just think it's interesting looking at the Latin, and I know you're a much better expert at Latin than myself, but that there was essentially two different terms as well, that suicidium, as we would think of it today, I mean, didn't even exist in the in the Latin, I mean, they would have assumed you were talking about pigs 
whereas the, the actual <laughs> word was mors voluntaria. Um, and, you know, as you said, the, the, the concept of, of reasons and causes were made all the difference about whether it was sort of honorable or not honorable, as well as the methods used. That's right. So uh, I haven't looked in a while. I believe the phrase in Latin, the idiom is uh, mortem sibi consciski, sort of a strange thing. It means to take your own life. The, the cases we're most familiar with, and I'm sure the listeners can be most familiar with, are the suicides that were compelled under um, the early Roman emperors, the Julio-Claudians. Uh, right. And those those are tough because they're sort of suicide under duress. They're like the Socrates suicide where the state comes along and they say, well, you can take your own life and your children will inherit your property or we can execute you. Uh, and they won't. And so that, you know, uh, so Seneca committed suicide under these terms. We're told Petronius committed suicide under these terms. It's kind of tough to call that suicide in the same way that I think um, we were talking about uh, uh, just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, but one of the problems these philosophies in the ancient world do tend to lead to is, uh, for example, with Epicureanism, if you're not supposed to be afraid of death, uh, then why not take your own life? And it's a really tough argument. Uh, we were thinking about this in a course I, I taught for some alumni here last week at Cornell, and I was trying to illustrate this through the song, Don't Fear the Reaper. Do you know this song by the Blue Oyster Cult? Yes, yes. Yeah. And it actually, the Blue Oyster Cult song, so I'm going to challenge your listeners to find the similarities between Don't Fear the Reaper, Catullus's first poem to Lesbia, where he says, Let us live, my Lesbia, and let us love. That's Catullus 5. And then Horace's Ode 111, which is the famous one to Laoconoe, where he says, Seize the day. So those first two poems are definitely Epicurean poems. These are guys trying to seduce women. They said, don't worry about your reputation. It doesn't matter what's going to come in the future. We've got to live in the moment and so on. And so it turns out, don't fear the reaper is meant to be the same thing. The, the guy who wrote the song said it's supposed to be a love song about you know, seizing the day and so on. And everyone immediately assumed that it was a, 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 like a call to bring death about. Uh, so I, I find it very striking when you uh, put all these things together, how we think about suicide, how we think about death, how we think about pleasure, how we think about mental illness. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I guess I was thinking about uh, the Seneca quote, which is, um, if I recall correctly, it's somewhere along the lines of, sometimes to live is an act of courage. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us can affirm that one. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, especially, you know, in circumstances uh, where you have no political freedom, as Seneca did, uh, or where, you know, you're living in an increasingly autocratic regime. Uh, that would be very difficult, but there's a million circumstances that spring to my mind about when life can be a little tough. But hopefully, you know, so Epicurus's solution to all this, Lucretius' solution, was to form communities. That's one of the most interesting things about, um, or t to my mind, about Epicurus himself was uh, coming up with a philosophy that seems to be the intellectual godfather of Epicureanism, uh, of, um, of libertarianism. And yet, instead of just casting everybody out and say, well, now you have this philosophy, go sink or swim, he formed these communities where he had people sign loyalty oaths to become members. The Garden seems to be something like a hippie commune in Athens uh, where everybody would go. And they, so they have abandoned the temples and the churches and the state religions, and they try to create their own meaning um, in these new communities that form specifically for the purpose of propping each other up. Is this like an ancient uh, Galt's Gulch? An ancient, say that again? An ancient Galt's Gulch. What is that? Maybe I'm, I don't know. The uh, Galt. Uh, who is John Galt? You know, Ayn Rand. I, uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. But I, I haven't seen it. Boy, I haven't read Rand in a very long time. So I'm missing the reference. Well, I was just thinking about, you know, the libertarian community and, uh, you know, uh, who is John Galt is usually a common sort of slogan to throw about and that the concept in um, Atlas Shrugged is that, you know, up in the mountains away from the the downfall of the overly bureaucratic uh, government and state is this free living community that has their own rules and uh, where they live more independently. 
Yeah, that is, as far as we can tell, that was what uh, the Epicureans were calling for, right? They say, uh, Lucretius has a beautiful part about this at the beginning of book two, uh, where he says, you need to shun politics, stay out of the limelight. It's not going to make you happy. It's just going to make you miserable. And the image uh, he has there at the beginning of book two is he says, you know, sometimes you look out at the Mediterranean Sea and you see some guy drowning and you think, oh, that's pleasant. <laughs> it's very strange. You say, that's not pleasant. That's horrible. This guy's dying. And he said, but it, he says, you know, you realize that that you're not involved with what's going on out there. And so you, you have this sort of serenity by stepping back. And then he he. Just as you're sort of freaked out by this image, then he says, well, you know, it's not so different from where you're sitting on top of a hill and you see two armies clashing in battle and all these people killing each other. And you think, well, I don't have anything to do with that. So he says you should stay out of politics. You shouldn't run for office. You should just sort of enjoy life away from all that sort of thing. And then Pericles would come along and say something along the lines of, well, just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean it doesn't take an interest in you. It's true. And then, of course, there's also the gap between, you know, the creed and the behavior, right? So we know some of the most famous Epicureans were heavily involved in politics. One of the assassins of uh, Julius Caesar, Cassius, was an Epicurean. Uh, that doesn't seem to fit with the furniture. Uh, Julius Caesar himself seems to have been an Epicurean, or he looks like one if you read Sallust. Uh, if you go to Sallust's um, War of Catiline, I think it's chapter 51, there's a long speech of Julius Caesar. And he says death is the end point. There's nothing after that. Uh, and yet here's Julius Caesar. I mean, he's doing the very opposite of staying out of the limelight. He's seizing the day in politics. And so the kind of the concepts of Epicurus philosophy versus um, Hippocrates' belief in, in the body and addressing the body for issues, what do you think the sort of modern implications of those kind of parallel contrasting philosophies are? So between Platonism and Epicureanism, is that? Uh, well, is that I was what thinking you're, uh, you're asking is the Hippocratic method. Um, Hippo Hippocrates, I misheard you. I, mean, I thought you said Socrates. So I, again, yeah. So that would be exactly the difference between a psychiatrist and a priest uh, nowadays, uh, as far as I can tell. So if you go, uh, the Hippocratic doctors, uh, they look to the bodies for all the things that are wrong with you. And it's like the cliche, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so if you go to a Hippocratic doctor with a broken arm, that's the right person, right? Then that, the person will set your arm and it will heal and so on. Uh, but if you go to the Hippocratic doctor and you complain that you're unhappy or you can't get off the sofa or that you're hearing voices and so on, the Hippocratic doctor is going to assume you have a brain disease. Uh, this is typically the model we're familiar with in psychiatry today. You have a, a broken brain or a chemical imbalance of some kind. Uh, and, of course, we don't diagnose mental illnesses. Uh, by definition, mental illnesses are not diagnosed by examining the brain. Uh, they're just diagnosed by talking to somebody and asking what the problems are. Uh, whereas if you were to go to a, a religious figure, a priest, a rabbi, an imam, in different traditions, then they're going to tell you that you have sort of a spiritual ailment, uh, which is sort of a fancy metaphor for uh, saying you've got something wrong in your life. And uh, so that's why uh, Plautus's Menike Me, I wrote a paper about this uh, some years ago, and in the play, Plautus's Menike Me, uh, this is exactly the issue that is being debated at the center of the play. There, um, do you know the play, The Menike Me? Uh, I'm not very familiar with it. Oh, you got to go get a copy. It's fantastic. So it is the uh, inspiration for Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors, and it involves two twins, identical twins, that are separated at birth, and they're raised apart. And you flash forward about, I don't know, 25, 30 years, and one of them goes out looking for the other. And in the meantime, it's uh, it so happened that they both have the same name. So uh, the day of the play, the, uh, the newcomer, the one twin, shows up in the hometown of the other. And they keep missing each other, but of course everybody knows their name. And uh, they keep mistaking the, uh, the guy who's just arrived for the guy who lives in town, and they can't figure out why he's acting so strange. And, and uh, everything seems wrong and unfamiliar, and he gets quite emotional. He gets accused of adultery by a woman who thinks that this guy is her husband. And so they summon a Hippocratic doctor who comes in and, uh, and the doctor diagnoses in uh, Hippocratic form, 
he diagnoses this total stranger as having a uh, mental illness, and he says, well, I'm going to give you hellebore that will knock you know, this illness right out of your body. And the guy says, I don't want to take any of your drugs. And so uh, the doctor calls in strong guys to come and forcibly restrain uh, this guy, and they're going to drug him against his will. Now, this is actually quite serious, but that's not so different from what can happen in uh, situations nowadays. It's, I think, the rule rather than the exception that people, uh, they don't want to take strong drugs against their, I mean, they're often given drugs and they say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. Uh, and so in psychiatry, that can be called the lack of uh, insight, right? You so-and-so doesn't know that he has a mental illness or she's got a mental illness. So for their own good, we're going to give them this medicine and it's going to make them better. And so it's coded in a form of paternalism. And uh, we could, I mean, I think it's debatable whether, it, it, we should debate whether that's a good idea in some cases, a bad idea in other cases. Yes, I always think um, that the spectrum of what is considered normal, healthy, or positive human behavior may have narrowed over the centuries and that we might not see the value of people who maybe exist mentally a, a more extreme places on that spectrum. That if it's just uh, considered be normal behavior or not normal, but, but what is normal? I mean, we're defining something within a certain realm as being normal or not. Absolutely, right? Uh, uh, yes. And so if normal is, is just a, a social agreement, that's what Epicurus would say. It's all just a convention. We've all just agreed that this is normal then deviation from it uh, would be social in origin, right? Uh, but if it's medical, right, that is, say, if it's like um, height, uh, if you may so in the, most people are, I don't know, five foot nine, and then so-and-so is two feet tall, you say, well, there's something going on there. That's, that, that's not social in origin. So um, when you take uh, sort of unhappiness or distress or high emotion out of the realm of things that can be objectively measured and they have to be measured subjectively, you're absolutely right that these things move all around. So when Europe was uh, more or less completely Christian 500 years ago, uh, they didn't have mental illness back then either. They had sin uh, and they had heresy. And a lot of the behaviors that we're familiar with today would have been characterized as one or the other. Um, now, in 2016, you won uh, the, the Thomas S. Saws Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Cause of Civil Liberties. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about that and uh, why you won that award? Oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. So Thomas Saws uh, was a, a very famous renegade psychiatrist. He wrote many, many books, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them, and I don't know, 500 or 1,000 articles, all about... Uh, psychiatry and he as a practicing academic psychiatrist he went into the field in order to discredit its premises um, and he said that this stuff is all social in origin it's all personal in origin it's politics it's economics it's not cellular diseases and that sort of thing so he dedicated his career to uh, to discrediting the the biological basis of mental illness and then he had a whole bunch of other ideas about what we should do if we uh, if, if he can convince us that uh, it's not medical in origin, but it's social or personal in origin, then what do we do about it? What are the policies? Uh, and so uh, when Sass took his life uh, in 2012, or uh, before he had, they'd established these awards for people that wrote um, uh, articles or books or made uh, activist contributions sort of in the same spirit. And in 2016, I won the award for uh, this article I wrote about uh, comparing, uh, well, it was, it was on the basis of several articles. One was about the monikme, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, comparing the monikme to a famous um, uh, study, you would say, the, called the Rosenhan experiment, where I saw the basic similarities between this 1973 psychology study done in Stanford and this ancient play from 22, 2300 years ago. So I compared those and uh, Sass himself was still alive then, and he thought that this was, made fantastic sense and so on. And then I wrote uh, a number of other articles when Sass took his life. I compared him uh, a sort of a um, – I went to the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, and I said, well, nobody at this entire gigantic meeting is talking about this sort of giant of the field. 
who's no longer here. So I said, I'm going to compare why he's, his policies and ideas have completely failed with why Epicureanism, which is so superficially at least similar, was a great success for six or seven or eight centuries in the ancient world. Uh, and what was very interesting about that, I subsequently published that piece. It's up on a website called madinamerica.com, uh, was that at the meeting, which is uh, there may be 50 or 60 psychiatrists in the room when it was over, half of them came up to me and they said, yeah, we think Sauce was right, but we just don't say so publicly. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Classical Wisdom Society members can listen to the entire podcast with Professor Michael Fontaine on classicalwisdom.com.